Hi guys, welcome to uh, episode 77 of my Warhammer 40k review series. This episode I'll be reviewing issue 77, um, because yep, that's how numbers work. Um, this week's issue sees us get part 3 of the Repulsor tank slash transport unit. We can see here we've got a lot of the uh, details in here, we've got a lot of the guns. We've got um, some of the bits of the turret, some of the bits of the, um, the collar where the turret seats, and several of the weapons. Um, it's got fantastic detail as always. Um, got that slightly different look on the um, on the Space Marine's armour because there's no belt around it, which is kind of interesting. Um, Loads of cool stuff, um, and loads of really, really good in-depth stuff. Yeah, so you've got some LAS cannons, some auto cannons, uh, some assault cannons, um, and some even bigger assault cannons. So lots of really cool, really awesome stuff to, um, to put together, as well as quite a few bits from the bits box. Um, sorry, for your bits box. Um, this isn't an easy to build model, um, hence it's got all the extras in it. Um, some of the models we've had have been easy to build, which means you just get exactly what you need to build that model um, in one configuration. This one gives you a lot of configurations, um, as you can see. As you can see from all the, um, the different bits of weaponry, um, just have to flip them around that you've got. Um, that's cool because it gives you a lot of bits box. It's also cool because it allows you to decide what you want. Some of these, if you cut them and magnetize them in the correct way, and I believe there are videos on YouTube for that, you will be able to <coughs> amend the um, configuration. Right, let's get into the um, into the book. A nice picture of a repulsor in front, as we have for the last two episodes, episode, and we'll have for. Uh, the um, the next episode, uh, signed by Ian, our spiritual liege. Um, this time we're looking at Devastated Squad. Now again, if you're just collecting this magazine and you're just playing Primaris, you won't get to see Devastated Squads. They are a tactical marine thing. You can buy them and you can use them in your units, but they um, they are. St or we call standard or old school marines, however you want to refer to it. They are the previous iteration of marines, they are not primaries. Um, Devastators are heavily armed space marine squads who are trained to fire at their enemies from great distance with overwhelming firepower. Base Guys, Max, I told you never to do that to the dog. Anyway. Okay, give me a second. Sorry guys, just had to deal with something. Um, they're very useful. They carry a lot of heavy firepower and a lot of configurations, and you can really use them to mess up your opponents. Where were we? Yeah. yeah. Um, as long as you port, units devastators provide their comrades with covering fire whilst also destroying enemy vehicles. Um, you can equip them with stuff that shoots a lot of firepower to take out um, hordes. You can equip them with stuff that shoots very heavy firepower in little numbers to take out vehicles. They're basically um, they're basically one of the fundamental workhorses of the standard marine units. Um, there's nothing quite like them in the Primaris. There are guys that fulfill those roles though. Um, we can see here the various weapons you get. You've got the missile launcher, the las cannon, the um, grav cannon and the heavy bolter. Um, <coughs> one they've missed out of there is the plasma cannon. You also get that. Um, so yeah, you get a lot of variants. Um, if you're not sure what to go for, the general rule is go for the missile launcher because it has crack ammunition and frag ammunition, which do both jobs reasonably well, making it very tactically flexible. Max, be quiet. Next, we've got the Centurion Devastator Squad. We covered um, the uh, um, Assault Centurions earlier. <laughs> These are the um, long range ones. They're basically a Marine in power armor, that's in power armor, that's got a heavy weapon strapped to each power fist. Um, they're very devastating, they're very nasty, 
and they do it. They, they're a very good model to have. Um, clad in hulking ceramite, war suits bristling with heavy weapons, the Centurion devastates the squad. So the squads command the battlefield, destroying to uh, foes in a torrent of fire. Um, he goes on to say, the Centurion war suit allows the space to engage with a foe, to engage a foe with the firepower of a walking tank. Unlike the Centurion, uh, Centurion Assault Squad brothers, Devastator Centurion stand back and pound their enemies with the remorseless and relentless firepower. They do still have the same problem that the uh, Assault Squad guys do in that you've got a very um, overwhelming and powerful um, war suit um, <coughs> with a powerful machine spirit that they have to control, but um, they're very powerful, very well armoured. And they're really useful on any battlefield. If we go through the uh, war gear, we've got the uh, chest hurricane bolter. <clears throat> a hurricane bolter gives you um, three bolter shots or six if you're using rapid fire, um, usually with rerolls. <clears throat> You've got the um, grav cannon and grav amp. Uh, grav cannon turns the mass of the target against them. Crumpling armor and crushing bone with graphitic force. The grab amp increases the power of grab weapons. So you only get one shot because grab weapons are very good. <clears throat> but it becomes more powerful with the grab amp. Um, the heavy bolters. Heavy bolters can be mounted on each arm of Centurion. These weapons fire explosive anti infantry rounds at a high rate of fire. Again, similar to what I said with the Devastator squads, you can equip them to take out lots of guys. The Centurion Missile Launcher. If a Centurion Devastator Squad expects to go up against heavily armoured enemies or vehicles, their chest mounted hurricane bolters can be exchanged for a missile launcher, which is pretty cool. And then the LAS cannons fire beams of focus light that can puncture holes through infantry and armour with ease, even incredibly long range. Also, they have an omniscope on top. Um, the device carried by the Centurion Devastator Sergeant allows the bearer to target enemies behind cover, so that's pretty nifty. I'm just going to quickly pause something because I've got to go and. Um, Make sure my dogs didn't, didn't just bite each other. Everyone appears to be alive in one piece. Awesome. Um, next, we've got the Space Marine Company organization. Um, this explains how um, Space Marines are, or Space Marine Companies are organized. Um, with the first company, you've got two lieutenants, you've got a captain, sorry, two lieutenants, a chaplain, an apothecary, an ancient, dreadnoughts and transports, and then you've got 10 veteran squads with um, Stone Guard, Vanguard, Terminators, and Intercessors. So that's uh, currently a more standard, a fairly standard organization. Then the second to fifth battle companies have a captain, two lieutenants, chaplain, apothecary, ancient, dreadnought transports, six battle squads, two close support squads, and two fire, two fire support squads. So again, we can see um, we can see how that works. It doesn't say with the battle line close support or fire support whether they're Primaris or Standard Marines. But already, um, if you're looking at this and you look back at the previous, uh, one of the previous videos where we covered uh, chapter organization, you can see how you get a lot of supernumeraries in here. You get a lot of guys who are addition to it. So for example, the six and seven battle line companies have a captain, two lieutenants, chaplain apothecary, ancient dreadnoughts and transports, and 10 battle squads. So 10 battle squads is 100, or, is 100 of Marines. Then you've got the captain, Two lieutenants, that's three. Chaplain, four. Apothecary, five. Ancient, six. Dreadnoughts. <laughs> Can, you know, let's, let's say a, a company has two dreadnoughts. That's um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, transports. Each transport driven, being driven by one marine and having one marine operate the things. Each squad has a trunk. Each battle squad has a transport. That's a, another, uh, what is it, two times ten, another twenty marines. On top of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twenty-eight marines. So 128 marines for a basic battle line company. <laughs> we can see how it builds up, and the um, the idea that it's a thousand marines is actually a fairly loose idea, even amongst this, which is pretty much the ultramarine standard. You've got the eighth, the eighth company, which is close support, and they have a captain, two lieutenants, a chaplain, a pothry, ancient. Uh, Dreadnought transports and 10 close support squads. Um, ninth is fire support, giving you a captain, two lieutenants, a chaplain, apothecary, ancient, dreadnought transports, and 10 fire support squads. Again, with neither of those, does it specifically say whether or not they're Primaris or, or old school marines? 
and the 10th company you've got the scout company um, which gives you captain two lieutenants a chaplain apothecary ancient scouts transports and 10 vanguard squads uh, it's interesting to see they've included scouts even if you include vanguard squads so you can have scouts and then a bunch of normal space wings but you're still using the uh, prime normal primary vanguards but you're still using the space wing scouts as well which is pretty nifty so you can see how it all adds up there you can see how the companies are organized in more detail and that that fits in with the chapter organization we got a few issues back which is pretty cool um anna could you get my burger out of the oven please Fair enough. Um, we've got Necrons. Um, this time they're going to Necrons. The Necrons are pretty important. They're fairly fundamental in a lot of the background, including the Imperial background. The um, on this site is believed to actually be a massive Necron shard underneath Mars. This legend was co-opted by the Emperor. Um, the Necrons actually assisted Gilliman in Gilliman, well in the attempt to um, defend Cadia, um, they've also wiped out things as well. Um, it's worth noting that nothing the Necrons do is out of the kindness of their hearts, because they don't have hearts. It's more a case that um, the Necrons that assisted knew full well that Chaos was their enemy as well, and that with Chaos spread across the universe, it would make it harder for them to rebuild and maintain their previous empire. Uh, the Necrons are the second oldest species in the 40k universe, the oldest being the old ones, and it's believed they're extinct. So, although there are rumours that one or two old ones may still exist. Um, Necrons, the Necron tier start, start up as this um, kind of Egyptian styled race, but they were very brutish, their bodies basically just were riddled with cancer and died over the course of a few short years. Um, they were they were constantly infighting. Uh, when they discovered the Old Ones, they asked them for the Seed of Immortality, which the Old Ones declined to share. Um, so the Necrons went to war with them. They didn't get the Seed of Immortality, what they got is their asses kicked. But then they met, they met the, the Catan, who gave them the secret of transporting their bodies into mechanical bodies. This was all a big trick, because the Necron, the Catan basically wanted the Necrons life energy because it's basically the Catan equivalent of Pringles. You know, they have to eat proper food like star energy, but once, you know, if you're a Catan, once you pop a living being, you just can't stop. Um, I'll read the blurb here. Uh, For thousands of years, the Necrons slept in tombs deep within the surface of countless worlds. Now they have begun to awaken, rising to find a galaxy much changed in their absence. They intend to bring the usurper races to heal and re-establish an empire that spans the stars. Ooh. Basically, they have a very ancient, undead Egyptian feel. There's a lot of copy of it from the Tomb Kings and things like that. So if you like the Tomb Kings or if you want to do conversions, you can really bring some stuff across there. The uh, new Ossiarch Bone Reapers also have a bit of a carryover in that they're built um, constructs. And again, with the aesthetics, if you want to do some weird stuff, there's, that's a great place to look for bits and pieces to make your Necron Lord you look unique. Um, it goes on to describe them. The Necrons were once a mortal race of flesh and bone, but long ago they traded their bodies for metallic replacements. Which I'll do that. Necrons... Uh, not really. Uh, Necrons once threatened to dominate the entire galaxy, but found their dreams of conquest crushed. In response, they seized themselves and started hidden tomb worlds awaiting the new age. They disappeared for so long that most races in the galaxy have forgotten their existence, if in fact they ever knew, or were born during the Necrons' hibernation. Even the Eldari, with whom they once fought, can barely recall their ancient foes. It's worth noting a lot of the Necron stuff the Eldari know is legends. The, uh, the Eldari have... Um, what they called the War in Heaven, which was a war between their gods, or at least some of their gods, and um, an evil sort of demonic, Necron, demonic race, which sounds very much like the Necrons. Um, they're not sure if they're both um, Necron, if they're both, uh, bear me a second. Sorry guys, I just had to pause it there again to be with the dogs. I would be recording my share, but I've got to sort of the lights out. It really leaves a bright white face. <coughs> um, yeah. 
The Necron Warriors are made of living metal that is capable of reshaping itself to repair damage. Severed limbs can even crawl back and reattach themselves. It's worth noting that they're, the metal is called necrom, uh, Necroderm or Necrodermis. And if that sounds uh, familiar, it's because the Primark of the Iron Hands uh, killed what looked like a Necron, what appears to have been a Necron War Machine and has Necrodermis Iron Hands, and that's pretty cool. Um, even Necrons would be on repair and not doomed for their bodies and minds teleported to the nearest tomb where their consciousness will be transferred into a new body. If you've ever watched Battlestar Galactica, <coughs> the new version, then you'll be familiar with that. Um, the galaxy's lesser races should beware, for the Necrons slumber beneath the surface of countless worlds. Once awoken, they will not rest until their empire rules the stars. Etc. It's quite interesting because the Necrons are put fundamentally at odds with several other races in the galaxy, not just the races they want to conquer and take the galaxy back from, but the Necrons have no requirement for living matter. Therefore, any worlds where they just expunge and destroy everything are going to be lost to the Tyranids, so the Tyranids aren't going to like them. It'd be interesting to see how those guys work. And they have no souls, so they're the antithesis of chaos, so chaos doesn't like them. So it's it's going to be really interesting, really interesting to see how that works. Um, <coughs> there's an interesting bit here, um, Ace of uh, Ancient Origins, which I'm going to read bits of it to you. Um, <coughs> when they're approached by a race of godlike being known as the Catan, the Necrod and Tear race were at the very brink of defeat in their war against the mighty beings known as the Old Ones. The Catan promised the Necron Tear, the means to defeat their mortal enemies, this offer was gratefully accepted. The Catan helped the Necron Tear abandon their bodies and transfer their minds into forms of living metal. They became the Necrons and were damned in the process. They had been betrayed by the Catan, who had used the transfer process to devour their souls. <coughs> Literally what the Catan do. Um, from what I understand, their idea of souls is a bit more like life energy than that, but Seriously, it, it doesn't really feed the Catan massively. Um, from what I understand, they need to consume the energy of star stuff. It's more like highly addictive Pringles. They're just really, really nummy nom nom. Um, Necrons destroyed the old ones in a war that killed billions on both sides. Uh, basking in the victory, the Catan did not see the Necron revenge coming until it was too late. The Necrons chan channeled the energies of the universe to shatter the immortal Catan into shards and enslave them. With the Catans, with the Catan overthrown, the Necrons retreated their tomb worlds to slumber until they were ready to rise again. Uh, basically, they'd taken so much damage in the war against heaven that they needed to, they needed to repair, and they needed to repair billions, and they didn't want to be exposed to the Eldari uh, and the Orcs and even proto mankind that were still around the universe because the old ones had created the Eldari and they created the Orcs as weapons. Um, whilst the old, whilst the old ones were gone. Their weapons were intelligent and still capable of hurting the Necrons, so they basically hibernated until they were ready to take on the um, until they were ready to take on the um, the Elder and and the Orcs again. Um, you got a beautiful showcase here. Um, they started off being much more android-like. It's only in later editions that they became very Egyptian. Uh, I think part of this was because of the success of the Tomb Kings in the Warhammer Fantasy uh, gaming system. Um, another part of this was because um, I, feel, I think GW felt they were still very bland. They were very much marching robots, kind of like the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator um, movie portrayed. Um, they wanted to give them more personality and give them a reason for doing a lot of the things that they did. So um, they still kept the lower Necron Warriors as not, as not having much personality, but the higher you are in the Necron hierarchy, the more personality you've got. Um, so yeah, you can see they've gone for a lot of gold and azure and things like that, so that's pretty cool. Okay, and here you've got some more images, some of the less human humanoid stuff. Um, there are questions as to whether Necrons were originally human or whether they chose it because it was a bit of a, uh, because it was an efficient form, two legs for walking, two arms for gripping. Um, realistically, it was chosen because the first ever Necrons to appear <coughs> were very much inspired by, as I say, um, 
James Cameron slash Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator. Um, and if you're not aware that where that was, they were they were listed as Chaos Androids in the Space Crusade uh, game, which is an old old game. And the uh, the theory is that the space space station that you went into in Space Crusade was was in part actually a Black Star space station, which is an old type of <sighs> Necron space station. The Black Star fortresses were taken over either by the Imperium or by Chaos, uh, and Chaos learned how to activate some of the tech, so they had access to basic Necron troops who weren't fully awake and were being commanded by them. It's only later when the Necrons rose that um, Chaos got kicked off the Black Star fortresses and those massive pieces of dangerous Necron technology reverted back to their masters, and they realised that they weren't androids, but they were in fact a life form all of their own. Um, <coughs> so, um, <coughs> yeah, so you've still got very much the, but I've kind of forgot where I started there. <laughs> you've still got very much the basic Necron there. Um, as they get um, more and more um, powerful, they get more and more personality. And then you get stuff like that which is a shard of the Catan. That's a shard of the Nightbringer, um, the remnant of a bound star god. Uh, the Catan were basically massive, kind of almost gaseous beings that just surrounded stars and ate them. Uh, they brought themselves into an almost humanoid form um, in order to talk to the Necrons and influence the world for no other reason than they wanted to destroy the old ones because the old ones got in the way of their feeding. Um, when they were shattered, they were kind of forced and bound into these minuscule compared to their actual size human forms <clears throat> and now they're dragged around by necrons who use them effectively as living weapons we've also got uh we've also got uh let's say some of the less humanoid stuff there you've got crypt spiders and other necron creatures because there is there's no actual reason that they have to be and tomb flares and that there's no reason that um necrons have to be humanoid that's just the original form they were put in <laughs> They've got a lot of robots um, and creatures that work for them. Um, whether or not they're full of Necrons uh, as well, I don't know, but that's certainly interesting. Okay, here we've got the How to Paint the Repulsor. <coughs> you should, in theory, be able to build, I think, this much tank with what you've got. I don't know if you can, but you're basically painting it blue, <coughs> which it already is, and then you're going to be dry brushing to lift the bits. Um, I've heard some people sort of going, well, if, I have to, if I'm going to paint it blue and already is, why don't I just dry brush it? The paint won't take on the plastic as well as it will, will other paints, so you need to base coat it. Either. Yeah, you need to put a base coat on it either way. There you've got them filling in the metal. <coughs> Lots of base details. <coughs> you can see that, mm, yeah, you definitely don't have all of this. Yeah, this, hasn't got, this isn't all the bits we've got, but, you know, the reason they've left some of the bits unstuck is so you can get into them and paint them more accurately. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's recommending you build bits of this and paint it before putting it together. You know, you can see that they've kept the turret separate. They've kept the grab plates off the bottom so you can get in and paint them. That's probably a good idea with a vehicle that uh, covers over itself so much, which means I probably won't do it. I'll probably just make sense of it. And then you've got painting the tech marine. You can see that the tech marine is red. We covered tech marines the previous week. One thing we didn't cover is that all tech marines paint themselves red um, to indicate they're from, to indicate that, not they're from, but <coughs> that they're tech marines. They paint themselves in the color of Mars, which is red and the color of um, <coughs> of the um, tech priest and Skitari. Um, they keep a shoulder, they keep one shoulder pad the color of their unit, of their chapter, as you can see. But the idea is you can always identify a tech marine. I suspect there are different um, things for non-codex compliant chapters and for chapters like Blood Angels or Red. Rather, I know there are different things, I just can't remember what they are off the top of my head. <laughs> it's got a nice bit on how to base it, and it's got a lot of cool stuff there. And this is roughly <coughs> what your repulsor tank should look like when it's finished. Next, we've got Crash Landing, another little mini story to get you ready to fight the battle. Um, here we go. Then we've got Recover the Repulsor. Oh, that's cool. You're not starting with a Repulsor tank. Um, damaged ultram a damaged Ultramarine Repulsor lies amidst the remains of a crushed transport craft. And that's nifty because you don't have a full tank. 
So this episode, this issue, they're expecting you to they're expecting you to build three quarters of a tank because you've got three templates, which isn't enough to finish it yet. There should be another template coming next week. So you build your three quarters of a tank. The ultra means must hold off opponents long enough to recover the vehicle and make their escape with it. So standard three battlefields where you decide which way you want them. You roll off. Uh, starting with the winner, take turns placing the battle mats um, in the layout shown above. Uh, set up the middle terrain in an agreed manner. Um, the repulsor tank serves as an objective. Place the repulsor in the middle of the board. The repulsor tank cannot move or fire any of its weapons during this game, which makes sense. You haven't got, oops, sorry. You haven't got all the bits of it and it done be broke. Um, the armies, both players are creating battle force armies with a maximum power rating of 50. And owl hands, apparently. Um, both the, both deployments are shown in the map. Uh, both players will roll off, and the winner can decide who deploys first. The players then alternate, placing their units, which is standard. Um, the player who finishes deploying the units takes the first, takes the, or uh, finishes deploying their units last, takes the first turn. So that's cool. Uh, victory conditions: eliminate enemy unit. One victory condition: first player to eliminate enemy unit one victory. Uh, sorry, one victory point. So that'd be two points for your first. For your first um, enemy unit eliminated, then one point for every enemy unit thereafter, or for the first player that eliminates an enemy unit. Eliminating a warlord, one victory point. <laughs> and to control the objective, you must have more than three models. Sorry, have more models within three inches of it. So I'll try that again. To control the objective, you must have more models within three inches of it than the enemy at the end of the game. The battle lasts five rounds. It does not say, you know, you three points for controlling the objective. So that really does give you an advantage, but doesn't guarantee a win. And they're, they're still going through the Citadel color system. I did a brief, a brief review on that uh, last episode. I might go into a more detailed one as a separate video later again, if I get the time. There's so many videos I want to make in so little time I've got to do them. Um, the next conquest gives you the final part of your repulsor, so that's pretty cool. It also covers the repulsor tank, which I'd imagine are the rules. Um, discover, the, discover the Inquisition, who are awesome and not on IO. <sighs> no, sorry. And the repulsor tank data sheet, um, so that's pretty cool. Um, then issue 79, we've got the we've got some more terrain, which is the Magnavent walkway, which is more of the um, <coughs> Mechanicum terrain. Uh, it's pretty awesome because it gives you a lot of levels. Um, you can see there, it doesn't have a base and has lots of bits hanging down. That does make it quite delicate. Um, I'll say this now and I'll probably say it again in the video, but what a lot of people are doing are getting a thin piece of MDF or a thin piece of plywood and gluing it and attaching it to that just because that makes kind of a box shape which gives it a lot more structural strength and massively increases the chances of you not snapping things off, particularly that little spidery skull thing there, which is awesome, but um, pretty delicate. You've then got Discover Death Guard Defilers, which are awesome, you're gonna like that, and learn the three ways to play, which um, is awesome, you're gonna like that. Basically, it's narrative, matched, and open, but I won't go into too much detail on those because that's all the episode i um, kept it nice and short this week because i realized i am overrunning a bit with my videos i hope you guys enjoyed it and i'll see you next time and if you're watching the uh, mortal realms video i will see you later tonight for that have a nice night guys hi guys hope you enjoyed that video and if you did remember to like and subscribe to my channel i'm also on facebook and twitter I'm not sure why but i am um so if you like it see me there and uh, please tell your friends Thanks very much. Bye.